Proponents of the anonymity hypothesis accept that there is wide agreement on the authorship of the Gospels from the time of Irenaeus onwards, but they maintain that there is a serious problem. All of these witnesses are writing much later than the authors of the Gospels were writing. This makes them too late to really be in a position to know what they were talking about. They want to claim that the names were attached to the Gospels probably sometime between 170 and 200 AD. Irenaeus thus becomes the source of our fourfold gospel tradition, and those who are later than Irenaeus have simply copied what Irenaeus has said. Ehrman explains, The first certain reference to the four gospels is in the writings of the church father Irenaeus. By the time of Irenaeus, it is not surprising that the church fathers would want to know who wrote these anonymous books. But the gospels that were widely accepted as authoritative in Irenaeus's circles were originally anonymous. The solution to the problem of validating these texts was obvious. They needed to be attributed to real established authorities. I will discuss Irenaeus and the evidential importance of his testimony presently. However, let us first turn to our earliest witness, Papias of Heropolis, whose testimony is significantly earlier than that of Irenaeus, possibly as early as 90 AD. Papias less controversially bears witness to Mark and Matthew as the authors of their respective Gospels, and even here, as we shall see momentarily, there is still some disagreement. Yet even limiting ourselves to the less controversial evidence, Papias' words challenge the anonymity of at least Matthew and Mark. But this, of course, raises the question, what about Luke and John? Bart Ehrman sees this as a potential problem, saying, It is somewhat curious, and certainly interesting, that Eusebius chose not to include any quotations from Papias about Luke or John. Why would that be? Were Papias' views about these two books not significant? Were they unusual? Were they contrary to Eusebius' own views? We'll never know. Nevertheless, I take a somewhat radical position. I maintain that there are good reasons for thinking that Papias bears witness to the authorship of both Luke and John as well. The evidence is stronger in the case of John, but it is also weighty in the case of Luke. Consider this often neglected fragment of Papias from the anti-Marcionite prologue to John. The Gospel of John was made known and given to the church by John while he yet remained in the body, as one, Papias by name, of Heropolis, a beloved disciple of John, has related in his Exoteric, that is, in his last five books. The prologue cites Papias as saying that John the Apostle authored the fourth Gospel. Skeptics will be swift to point out that the prologue contains some dubious historical information. In particular, most historians doubt the truth of the claim that John the Apostle had ever had physical conflict with the heretic Marcion. Importantly, however, the prologue is not the source of this information about John's authorship, for the prologue is merely passing on information obtained from Papias. Therefore, Papias, rather than the prologue, is the source of the testimony to John's Gospel. Monte Shanks reminds us, there is some question regarding the credibility of the author of this fragment when handling historical material. It should be noted, however, that he was not inaccurate with respect to everything he wrote concerning Papias. He correctly noted, for example, that Papias was from Heropolis, and that he had written a five-volume work. While certain material contained in this fragment requires critical analysis, this fragment should not be unnecessarily marginalized as having no historical value. I suppose the die-hard skeptic could maintain that the author of the prologue was claiming that Papias said things which he never in fact wrote. After all, since Papias's writings have been lost, we have no way to definitively confirm the accuracy of this citation. But it seems unlikely that the author would have put these words in Papias's mouth in light of the fact that the author of the prologue gives a fairly specific reference to the exact book where Papias allegedly says this. Presumably the book was still around in his day, and so the reference could have been checked, which would almost certainly deter the author of the prologue from making bogus references to it. Consequently, we have strong reasons to think that Papias told us not just that Matthew and Mark wrote their respective Gospels, but also that John wrote his. But the evidence gets even better. In Ecclesiastical History 324, 5-12, Eusebius mentions a record which recounts the history of the writing of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A record preserves that they took to writing out of necessity, Matthew having first preached to Hebrews, 
and when he was on the point of going to others, supplied to those from whom he was sent through his writing the lack of his presence by handing down the gospel according to himself, written in his native tongue. And after Mark and Luke had already made the publication of the gospels according to them, John, it is said, used all the time a proclamation which was not written down, and at last came to writing for the following cause. After the three Gospels which had been previously written had already been distributed to all, and even to himself, they say that he welcomed them, and testified to their truth, but that there was therefore only lacking to the scripture the account concerning things which had been done by Christ at first, and at the beginning of the proclamation. The record is certainly true. Eusebius does not name the source of this record, but a literary analysis by Charles Hill demonstrates close parallels between what Eusebius' source says about Matthew and Mark and what Papias says about Matthew and Mark. Hill shows that both Eusebius' source here, as well as Papias, share several words and ideas. The comments Eusebius preserves about the origin of the Gospel of John in 324.11 have the same formula as the comments he preserves about the origin of the Gospel of Mark in 2.15.2, where Eusebius explicitly quotes Papias as his source. The similarity in formula suggests a common source for both traditions, and since Papias is known to be the source in Book 2, it is most likely that he is also the source in Book 3. There is also a common concern in both Eusebius' quotations of Papias in 3.39.15-16, as well as in Eusebius' record here in 3.24.5-13, as Hill argues, an emphasis on the supplemental nature of John's Gospel in our fragment fits with the concern for the proper order of the events in Mark's Gospel, felt in the report of Papias' elder in 339.15. Mark wrote accurately all that he remembered, not indeed in order, of the things said or done by the Lord. John, on the other hand, it is implied in our fragment, gave the proper order, even naming the first of the Lord's signs. In addition to these common themes and concerns, there are also common words. As Hill points out in his very detailed article on the subject, three times in the short space of 339.15, Papias' account of Mark, there occurs a distinctive feature of the elder's paraphoristic use of poyo in the middle voice with an accompanying noun. The same feature turns up here in 324.7, where Eusebius is paraphrasing his source. The elder quoted by Papias in 339.15 also has a distinctive way of speaking about the contents of the Gospels. A great deal of attention has been given to his mention of the Lord's Logia, which he says Matthew and Mark contain. This has sometimes obscured the fact that this presbyter also speaks of Mark as recording the things said or done by the Lord, using here the aorist passive participle. The source used by Eusebius in 334 uses the same notation. The passive participle aorist or imperfect of preso for the deeds of Jesus and the Gospels occurs no less than four times in Eusebius's paraphrase and summary of his source. All of this is very suggestive that Eusebius is here relying upon Papias. In Ecclesiastical History 2.15.1, Eusebius explains the origin of Mark's Gospel, which he refers to as a recollection of Peter's teaching. He cites both Papias and Clement of Alexandria as sources. So our two most promising candidates for Eusebius' source when he revisits the topic in Book 3 are Papias and Clement. Moreover, we know from Clement's own writings that he had read Papias. So Papias emerges as being the true source of this information, and therefore, it is more likely that Eusebius is paraphrasing Papias in this passage in Book 3. Hill says, it is hard for me to believe that an independent source on the origins of the four Gospels would share all of these characteristics with the account of the origins of Matthew and Mark explicitly attributed to Papias. Michael Cock objects to Hill's thesis, maintaining that Clement of Alexandria is just as likely to be Eusebius' source here as Papias. He argues, Papias' agreement with Clement may be restricted to the notice that Mark was Peter's interpreter, if Hill were to be right on a single source, the source may be Clement. But Cox's treatment of Hill's argument utterly fails to do justice to the many literary characteristics noted earlier, which are shared between Papias and this unnamed source in Eusebius, and which are not shared between this source and Clement. This source very clearly mentions that Matthew was written in the Hebrew tongue, similar to what Papias says about Matthew being written in a Hebrew dialect. Clement, by contrast, says nothing about the language or dialect of Matthew, 
Eusebius's source shows concern over the order in John's Gospel, just like Papias does with the order of Matthew and Mark. But Clement does not share this concern, and the distinct Greek verbiage shared between Papias and Eusebius's source is likewise absent from Clement. In contrast to Cox's proposal, Papias is just clearly the better candidate source than Clement. Richard Bauckham also objects to Hill's hypothesis on the grounds that what Eusebius's source says about Matthew is incongruent with what Papias says about Matthew. He argues, in 339.16, Papias is concerned with the issue of order in the Gospels, while 324.6 is explaining how it was that Matthew was obligated to write his Gospel. The two statements cannot be combined into a single account from the same context. Unfortunately, Bauckham offers no reasons for thinking that these two statements could not occur within the same context. As Hill says in response to Bauckham, on the contrary, I think that they would fit together quite well. There is no reason why these two concerns might not have been combined in the same account. In 324, 5-7, Eusebius is only repeating enough of the source's information on Matthew, Mark and Luke 2, as will provide the necessary background for relaying its tradition on John, which is clearly the subject at hand. It is quite reasonable to suppose that his source in 324, 5-13, whose aim clearly was to give information about the origins of each of these Gospels, did so in order, and that the information Eusebius quotes about Matthew and Mark in 339, 15-16 would fit well after the information he so briefly summarizes in 324.6. Bauckham further objects that, although both sources share a common concern over the order within the Gospels, they have radically different solutions to this concern. He writes, The solution to the difference in order between the Gospels that Papias must be inferred to have offered is that John's Gospel does follow a correct chronological order, while the other Gospels, at least Mark and Matthew, do not. In 324, 5-15, the solution is quite different. The four Gospels are reconciled without an admission that any of them is not in order. However, this objection depends upon a particular interpretation of Papias' words. Bauckham assumes that Mark's order is being compared to John's, but as Hill points out, this may be so, but we may only think this from inference or speculation. For nowhere in the account which Eusebius relates in 339, 15-16 is John mentioned. In fact, this section does say that one Gospel writer did make an ordered arrangement, and that writer is Matthew, not John. It is, I believe, quite true that in the tradition from the Elder repeated by Papias, all the Gospels are being considered with respect to the question of literary arrangement. The unnamed source Eusebius uses in 324, 5-13, definitely focuses on John's preservation of the beginnings of Jesus' ministry, omitted from the other Gospel accounts, and not on the chronological order of events in the rest of the Gospel story. The issue of an author's order, or the lack of it, cannot be restricted to matters of chronology. Hill argues that no known source upon which Eusebius might have depended shares all of these parallels other than Papias, and since we know that Eusebius had access to Papias, it is most reasonable to infer that Eusebius' source here just is Papias. As Hill concludes, both accounts also stress the respective apostles' work of preaching before they wrote. What is more, after introducing the accounts of both Gospels, Eusebius follows the first excerpt about John with the words, and the record is surely true. The record here naturally referring to the preceding one. Eusebius is definitely presenting this count of the origins of Matthew and John as from a single written source, and though he does not name that source, there is no credible alternative to regarding it as Papias of Heropolis. These common elements and concerns point to a common source. From a comparison with the other Papian fragments on the Gospels in Eusebius, then, there is fairly conclusive support for regarding Eusebius' source in 324, 5-13, as being Papias' tradition about the fourth gospel. If Hill's hypothesis is correct, then Papias names all four gospel authors. The question might be raised as to why Eusebius does not name Papias, but the answer to this is pretty straightforward. Eusebius did not like Papias, and elsewhere in his writings, he took great pains to distance Papias from John the Apostle. So we know that Eusebius would have had ample motivation not to cite Papias in this particular passage.